Today on Brief History, we take a look at a king of Britain who was not initially expected to inherit the British crown. Experiencing a relatively happy childhood, he would make slow progress into adulthood before being thrown into the crucible of kingship during tumultuous times. His time as king would see constitutional crisis, economic disaster, a world at war, and the fall of powerful monarchies around the world. Join me as I take a brief dive into the life and legacy of King George V of the United Kingdom. Prince George Frederick Ernest Albert was born on June 3, 1865 at Marlborough House in London, England. He was the son of King Edward VII, who was, at the time of George's birth, the heir to the British throne, and Alexandra of Denmark was his mother. George was the second child and son of six children between his parents, with five of these children surviving to adulthood. Not all of George's siblings will come up throughout his story, but one will, his elder brother, Prince Albert Victor, known as Eddie by George's family. Before we get into George's early life, it is important to briefly discuss the situation he was born into and the events that had taken place leading up to his birth. George's paternal grandmother was Queen Victoria of the United Kingdom, who is known today for a multitude of reasons, but especially for her long reign as monarch of the British Isles. She had developed a heavy reliance on her husband, George's grandfather, a man named Prince Albert of Saxe Coburg and Gotha, who had, in essence, taken over many of the Queen's private duties in running the country. Unfortunately, only a few years prior to George's birth in 1865, his grandfather Prince Albert died, sending the Queen into an infamous long bout of mourning, which caused her to withdraw from society and her public duties. George's father, at the time the Prince of Wales and heir to the British throne, had been involved in a sexual scandal prior to Prince Albert's death, which the Queen blamed for her husband's death. Thus, George's grandmother and George's father's relationship was strained to a breaking point, which was not surprising because the Queen had been anything but kind to George's father in his youth. George's father would become famous for his philandering ways, being keen on living a fast life filled with many mistresses and less than reputable friends. But at the time of George's birth, his father and mother had only been married for a couple years, and thus the relationship between the two was still strong due to the fact that George's father had not yet strayed into the unfaithful life he would become known for. It should be noted that George's parents and grandparents were foreign in a sense, as his mother had been raised in Denmark, his grandfather had been raised in Germany, and his grandmother had been raised by her German mother. Thus, German was spoke regularly by the British royal family, and George's father was said to have had a German accent when he spoke English. George would break from this tradition, in part due to his poor education, which we will touch on shortly, but also due to the fact that he was geared much more towards British life. George was brought into the world with disagreement surrounding him, as his grandmother did not like the name George, as she thought it was too German or Hanoverian, which was ironically the name of the royal house that she was a part of. The German Hanoverian monarchs had come to the British throne in the early 18th century, and George's grandmother would be the last British monarch of this house. She had grown up during the reigns of her uncles, who had lived debaucherous lives, and the queen attempted over her life to distinguish herself from their style of rule, hence why she didn't like the Hanoverian name. But George's father would hear none of it, and thus he was named George against his grandmother's wishes. George, relatively speaking, had a very happy childhood, and this was largely due to the torment that his father had endured in his own youth. George's father had been brought up with strict disciplinary structured learning, which he failed at miserably. He was shown little to no affection, was isolated from his peers, his age, and was treated all in all very poorly by his parents, due in part to his inability to learn as fast as his siblings. Although George's father would be, in George's youth, distant to a degree, he would also be affectionate and would prove to be a good father to George as he grew for reasons we will discuss eventually. However, as we will see, George himself would not necessarily pay this forward as he would not show his own children the same care and affection that was shown by his father to him. In 1871, when George was six, 
a man named Reverend John Dalton was installed as he and his brother's tutor. This was an unfortunate development as Dalton would be a bad teacher to both George and his elder brother Eddie. Dalton cared more about rubbing elbows with royalty than teaching his subjects properly, and this led to unfortunate repercussions. Dalton, although ultimately being responsible for the prince's poor education, was able to convince George's parents that it was not he who was the problem, but rather the students themselves, and that the boys were just simply lacking in ability. Both boys began to show signs that they were slipping behind, but of the brothers, George's elder brother Eddie seemed to be struggling most. With the prince's education leaving much to be desired, Dalton suggested that the princes should be sent to sea as naval cadets, with he himself going along with them, of course. Due to George's parents being none the wiser, they agreed with Dalton's suggestions, and the princes were duly sent to Devon to be put aboard the HMS Britannia in 1877 to begin their naval careers. Here, George began to distinguish himself from his elder brother, and a gap began to develop intellectually between them. George showed promise while training as a cadet, while his elder brother fared much worse, continuing to do poorly in his education. Eddie was said to have leaned on his younger brother as George's talents began to finally show through. Dalton, continuing to fail in his duties as tutor, suggested another change, that George and his brother, again accompanied by him, should go on an extended sea voyage. George's complacent parents once again agreed, and George and his brother, accompanied by Dalton, boarded the HMS Bacant and set sail, remaining with the ship for the next three years. This was a risky decision, as both boys were at times in danger due to poor weather and bad storms, but they ultimately survived their long experience at sea. With their education, which included foreign languages, lacking in many ways, after their return the princes were sent to the continent to work on their French and German, but they again fell short of expectations. After this, the princes were finally separated, with George and Eddie going separate directions. Luckily for George, Dalton remained with Eddie, who traveled to Cambridge to begin studying there. George, for his part, continued in the Navy, as he had been promoted to midshipman. Thus, by 1889, when he was 24 years old, George was given his own independent command. The Navy, all in all, was a relatively good experience for George, as it taught him many things and gave him a good understanding of discipline. But it was also here that George would develop the habit that, like his father, would eventually kill him, smoking. George was finally making progress as a young man, and indeed, this was an important time in his life. But at this point, George was the spare to his brother the heir, and in fact, with his grandmother alive, he was the spare to the heir of the heir. His prospects of becoming king looked thin, or at the very least, distant. But little did anyone know the unfortunate changes that were about to take place in Britain, and the new life that was at hand for George. By the late 1890s, George's father had experienced a multitude of scandals which had not only set his father apart from his grandmother, Victoria being someone who detested that type of behavior, but had also brought great unpopularity to the royal family in the country. Despite this, George remained loyal to his father, although he decided that he would live differently than his father had, being pious and reserved during his life. However, a concerning problem was becoming clear in Britain. George's brother Eddie was not coming along as hoped nor had he shown any kind of the potential that George had shown during his time in the Navy. Eddie was said to have been a kind young man, but simple and inept, lacking judgment or restraint. It was not long before serious trouble came to light, as it was rumored that Eddie had been involved with the so-called Cleveland Street Scandal, where it was alleged that he had been a regular visitor to a homosexual brothel, homosexuality being illegal at that time. Whether this was true or not can never truly be known, but after this, it was determined that Eddie would need a wife, and so one was quickly found for him. He was made Duke of Clarence, and the young woman, chosen as what was thought to be a suitable bride for Eddie, was Princess Mary, nicknamed May, of Tech, and the pair were quickly betrothed. Unfortunately, the wedding between Eddie and May would never take place, as the events that followed shortly after this betrothal would change the trajectory of the British royal family, and indeed, George's life, forever. In January 1892, Eddie was out shooting at Sandringham when he was taken back inside due to him feeling ill. Over time, he began to deteriorate slowly, and it was determined that he had contracted influenza, a sickness which had been particularly bad that year. As Eddie continued to decline, his family was gathered by his bedside, as it seemed clear that the young prince would not survive. Unfortunately, this experience would be a gruesome one. George and his family sat next to Eddie for over seven hours, 
and watched him slowly and graphically die in front of them, which was an event that many of those present would carry with them for the rest of their lives. On the 14th, George's brother finally succumbed to his illness and died at the age of 28. This was a devastating loss to the British royal family, especially George's father, who would be affected greatly by his eldest son's death. Although Eddie was greatly loved by his parents and siblings, due to his lacking ability in his education, many saw this death as an unfortunate and terrible blessing. The much more capable George was now his father's heir to the British crown, although at the time, George's grandmother Queen Victoria was still alive. George, who had recently recovered from typhoid, the illness that had killed his grandfather and almost killed his father, ended his naval career and was created the Duke of York. Like Eddie before his death, it was soon determined that now George would need to find a bride, and interestingly, he was pushed towards his dead brother's former fiance, Princess May of Tech. Although there was not said to have been a deep attraction or desire to marry between the two, George duly proposed and May accepted with the wedding taking place in 1893. Unlike his father, George would prove to be loyal to his wife, remaining faithful and avoiding the company of mistresses. After the marriage, George spent much of his time in the years between his marriage and ascension shooting at Sandringham, George's principal residence at York Cottage being on the Sandringham estate, with all of his children being born between 1894 and 1905. Two of these children, his eldest two sons Edward and Albert, will come up again later in his story. In 1901, George's grandmother, the old Queen Victoria, finally passed away after serving as the longest reigning British monarch at the time. This brought George's father to the British throne as King Edward VII, and although George's life had certainly changed, perhaps for the better, he, now the Prince of Wales, was still unprepared for the role that was soon to be coming his way. Luckily for the prince, his father would greatly assist his son in these matters. King Edward VII had always had a tumultuous relationship with his mother, the Queen, as we briefly touched on previously, and this meant that the Queen had refused to assist her son in learning the processes of government that he would eventually be forced to deal with. George's father did not want to continue this practice with his son, and so went out of his way to make sure that George was included in government so as to get the young prince's feet wet and give him a chance to cut his teeth. This did not mean that the two did not disagree with one another, they did, but the king always kept his son's best interests in mind, and George was always keen to respect his father. Major events were taking place throughout the world, and these events would ultimately lead to one of the world's worst conflicts, which George would have to deal with himself, although of course no one knew this at the time. There were many aggressors that were presenting themselves on the continent, and were becoming increasingly hostile towards Britain, one of which being Germany, and thus it seemed that Europe was creeping ever closer towards war. George's father played his part as an international figure by fostering friendly relationships with France and Russia. This angered the German leadership as the Germans were, perhaps understandably, afraid of continental encirclement by hostile nations. Germany set about or increased a program of shipbuilding in response to this, which Britain rivaled with their own. But this would not be the only concerning development as issues were arising in Britain as well. Two important individuals in government, David Lloyd George and Winston Churchill, put forth the so-called People's Budget, which in short was an attempt to bring forth a social welfare program at the expense of more wealthy landowners in the country. This put at odds the two houses of government, where the conservative House of Lords, which was populated by land-owning peers, were opposed to the budget, and the liberal commons, who had great support from the populace, were of course for it. This, in essence, put the people against the aristocracy and brought forth a constitutional crisis in government with George's father at the center. George's father, the king, was prodded to make new peers to flood the House of Lords with liberal and pro-reform-minded peers so that the measure could be passed there. But this would circumvent the purpose of the House of Lords and leave it as a shell of an institution. Thus, George's father was reluctant to do such a thing. But not doing so and letting the peers shut down a bill which had so much support nationally by the people would leave the crown open to the accusation of being opposed to democracy. This of course is a gross oversimplification, but all in all, it would not be the king who would have to deal with the issue, but George himself. In 1910, after a lifetime of excess in smoking, George's father the king died after reigning for only nine years. George, almost 45 years old, was now the king of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. George was lucky to have had a father who cared that his son was informed when he came to the throne. Due to King Edward's desire to help his son, 
George would come into possession of the British crown, better informed politically than his father had been, and this was very important. One reason this was important was due to the international situation that he had inherited, which at the time was becoming intense. As it turned out, George was related to many leaders of other European nations due to many of his grandmother, Queen Victoria's children, being married off into the royal houses of other European royal families prior to George's birth. The two most important leaders that had emerged were Kaiser Wilhelm II, German Emperor, and Tsar Nicholas II of Russia, both first cousins to George. George's father had, prior to his death, formed positive connections with Tsar Nicholas II of Russia, and the Russians were essentially in alliance with France at the time. However, George's father had failed to foster a positive relationship with Kaiser Wilhelm before he had died, and this cemented the contentious relationship between Germany and Britain, which was inherited by George. Kaiser Wilhelm had had a difficult childhood, which had morphed him into an arrogant, difficult, and demanding man. Although he was related to the British royal family, his mother being a daughter of Queen Victoria, he had nothing but contempt for his British royal family members, with the exception of brief periods of reconciliation at times. As tensions regarding Germany's continental encirclement continued to rise, the shipbuilding programs of both Germany and Britain continued, as Europe inched ever closer to war. Furthermore, Austria-Hungary, which was ruled by the famous Habsburgs, annexed Bosnia and Herzegovina, bringing forth the so-called Bosnian Crisis, which also added to the European tensions on the continent. George still had issues to deal with at home as well. We remember that Parliament was on the verge of a constitutional crisis when George's father died, and George inherited also this tense situation in government. However, in the end, the sequence of events that would play out would be similar to the events that had played out during the reign of King William IV in 1832. The pro-reform liberal members of Parliament convinced George that if the people's budget were reintroduced and passed in the Commons, but rejected in the Lords, George would be forced to flood the House of Lords with liberal peers in order to see the measure passed. As we remember, this was something that George's father was reluctant to do, but George, convinced by liberal MPs, agreed to the measure. Although certain members of the Lords attempted to amend the budget in order to make it difficult to accept, once they realized that George was indeed prepared to flood the House of Lords with liberal peers, they relented, with many peers absenting themselves in order to see the measure passed. This was a great relief to George, as he was able to see national demand implemented without damaging the nature of the House of Lords, although it should be noted that some of the House of Lords' powers were limited by the passing of the bill. Although the potential constitutional crisis was concerning, this was not the only problem that George was facing within Britain, as there were other serious issues at hand as well, especially related to Ireland. Irish nationalism was growing, and the idea of so-called home rule was being requested from certain Irish politicians who had been promised this if they supported certain bills in government. Home rule was, as its name implies, the idea that Ireland was, in essence, to become a self-governing entity under the British crown, with the British parliament not interfering in Irish affairs. The Irish nationalists who were pushing for this were opposed by the so-called Unionists in Ulster in the north of Ireland, who wished the parliamentary situation to remain the same. Further fuel was added to this fire by the fact that much of the divide in politics was exacerbated by religion, Unionists in general being Protestant and Nationalists in general being Catholic. In the end, Home Rule would be implemented in 1914, but events on the continent caused British attention to focus elsewhere and the Home Rule would be suspended temporarily. The heir to the Austro-Hungarian Habsburg throne, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, was assassinated in Sarajevo along with his wife, which set in motion a chain of events that would lead to disaster. Britain was part of the so-called Triple Entente with Russia and France, whereas Germany was allied with Italy and Austria-Hungary in the so-called Triple Alliance. The assassination was the spark that lit the powder keg of tension that existed on the continent, and the resulting conflict would be one of the most devastating conflicts in world history, which would see millions of lives lost. This war is of course known today as World War I, or the Great War, and George was now the head of a country who would unfortunately have to play a major role in the conflict. As British forces deployed to the continent and economic downturns affected the people in Britain, George played his part as a wartime monarch with success, limiting excess in order to show his people that he was willing to stand beside them in the face of the terrible conflict. He closed Balmoral, limited shooting at Sandringham, and ate frugally with no alcohol being consumed. George made hundreds of trips to the front to visit troops, engaged in the devastating experience that was trench warfare. 
Both of George's eldest sons, Edward and Albert, were sent off to do their part in the conflict, and they will be discussed in more detail shortly. George was devastated to learn of the losses that the war was inflicting on British forces, which were exacerbated by extremely bloody battles, like that of the Somme and Verdun. Trouble still existed at home, however, as a rebellion broke out in Ireland in 1916, which was known as the Easter Rising, where Irish nationalists rose up against the continued British rule that existed as a result of World War I. Although it was suppressed, it was a precursor to the inevitable break with Ireland, which was on the horizon. Due to Britain being at war with Germany, George had serious reservations and concerns about his family name due to his grandfather and grandmother essentially being German in many respects. George's grandmother was the last Hanoverian monarch, Hanover being a German name itself as we already discussed, and George's father was the first monarch from the house of Saxe Coburg and Gotha, another German state, which is where his grandfather Prince Albert had been from. This very German sounding name was not something that George wanted associated with the British royal family due to the terrible conflict raising on the continent and Germany being an enemy of the British. Thus, George took the incredible steps of rebranding the royal family by renaming his house the House of Windsor, a decidedly more British name. Furthermore, when the Russian Revolution broke out in 1917, George, again fearing that he may be linked with foreign interests, refused his lookalike cousin, Tsar Nicholas II, refuge in Britain. This would have unfortunate consequences, as the Tsar and his innocent family would be brutally murdered by the Bolsheviks after they were removed from power. Although Russia fell and made peace with Germany, which allowed Germany to focus on its western front with Britain and France, the United States ultimately entered the war on the side of the Entente. Germany was unable to sustain its armies, and its leadership collapsed in 1918, bringing forth the end of World War I with a victory for Britain and her allies. George had played his part as king wisely during these tumultuous times, and the result was that of the four major monarchies that existed before the war, he was the only monarch to survive the conflict with his crown intact. The Austro-Hungarian, German, and Russian monarchies all ceased to exist after hostilities ended, with the monarchs either being deposed, exiled, or killed. The Great War may have come to an end, and George may have remained as King of Britain, but this was far from the end of troubles for the 53-year-old monarch. The last chapter of George's life would be anything but easy. As the devastating years of the First World War came to an end, and the depressing reality of the losses became apparent, over 900,000 men from the British Empire would ultimately be killed in the conflict, it was becoming clear that further reform was needed in Britain. With so many people, men and women, being mobilized for the war, calls for representation were growing, and the Fourth Reform Act of 1918 was an attempt to give these people what they desired. This act gave all men over 21 and all women over 30 the right to vote, and although George was probably more inclined to dislike these things, being traditional in his ways, he nevertheless became the face of a more democratic monarchy. That did not mean, however, that post-war Britain would be a cakewalk for George. On the contrary, George was to experience great difficulties as he entered into his last days as king, for not only was the world changing, but much of the world was changing void of monarchy at all. George was forced to change with the times, and although he also may have had to do this begrudgingly, at the very least, he kept a hold of his crown. There were many calls for independence around the world from countries under the British imperial umbrella. Of course, Ireland was at the top of this list, but there were others as well, which included some locations that were much further from the British Isles, like India and Egypt. Ireland had been partially dealt with during the war, but the compromises and agreements that were reached were essentially a band-aid over a gaping wound. Changes would unfortunately, or perhaps fortunately, depending on how one views it, need to come about in Ireland, and indeed they did. As nationalist sentiment continued to rise in Ireland, still opposed by the Protestant Unionists in the North, the push for independence began to increase significantly. By 1922, negotiations took place to see an Irish free state come to be, which, it was hoped, would allow a southern Irish free state to exist within the British Empire with the Northern Unionists remaining in union with Britain. It was hoped that this would bring forth peace, but unfortunately this was not to be. What would ultimately come about would be civil war between Northern and Southern Ireland as the Protestant Unionist Northerners fought to remain under British rule where the Catholic Nationalist Southerners fought to break completely free from the British state. 
This conflict would continue well into the late 20th century, and indeed, much of these issues have not been settled to this day. Britain was also in debt after World War I, mainly to the US, which was particularly galling to George as he did not like Americans, perhaps due to the fact that the shift in world power had already begun to creep across the Atlantic. With social anxiety sweeping through Britain, George and his queen visited rundown areas of London and traveled the kingdom visiting schools, factories, hospitals, and mines as he continued to try and remain publicly as somewhat of a father figurehead of the nation. In this, George did reasonably well, earning the population's trust both during and after the war. But although George was reasonably successful in presenting himself as a father figure to his people, as a father to his children, George has been remembered far less generously today. Despite the fact that George had benefited greatly from his father's interests and his political well-being, George was a demanding and at times harsh father to his children, especially his two eldest sons. Both he and his wife Mary were often distant and cold towards their sons, and this brought forth great trouble for the boys. Both of the boys had been sent to the Navy, like their father had been, with the eldest son, Prince Edward, who was known as David by his family, doing reasonably well, developing a charm and a way with strangers. With the second son, Albert, however, the results were more unfortunate. Albert had a much different personality than his elder brother, being shy, anxious, and sensitive, which did not mix well with life at sea or with a demanding father. Young Albert developed a stammer, which George was famously said to have impatiently scolded his son for, quote, not getting it out. As the princes had aged, they had done their duty in the First World War, and soon the next chapter of their lives came about. For the eldest son, Edward, this meant extended tours abroad in the US, Canada, Australia, India, etc., which exhausted the young prince and left him wanting. Unfortunately, Prince Edward's behavior was becoming more and more disturbing to his father, the king, as although he was publicly charming and handsome, Edward had developed a taste for fashion, alcohol, America, and worst of all, married women. The relationship between George and his eldest son deteriorated quickly as Edward was exhibiting signs that he had perhaps inherited some of his grandfather's playboy ways. George was concerned, or perhaps convinced is a better word, that his son would make a poor king when his time came. Little did he know what incredible events would play out shortly after his death and the ruinous decisions Edward would make, which would ultimately lead to his downfall. George's younger son, Albert, however, seemed to be much more in line with what his father wanted. He still had a stammer, and steps would be taken to try and correct this, but Albert had married in 1923, with his first daughter, Elizabeth, being born three years later in 1926. Few knew at the time the important role that both Albert and his daughter would play in the decades to come. But as the 1920s came to a close, George began to experience health issues that would ultimately lead to his demise. He was by that time in his 60s, and like his father, years of heavy smoking had taken a toll on his lungs. He developed a serious sickness in 1928, and although he recovered, it was clear that he would never be back to his old self. Furthermore, the Wall Street crash in the beginning of the Great Depression added further stress onto an already declining George. That is not to say that he did not play an important role during this time, however, as he was instrumental in forming a new, quote, national government supported by both opposing sides of government after the Labor Party was devastated by the Depression. Nevertheless, the economic downturn continued to take its toll on the populace. Concerning developments were taking place on the continent as well. In the wake of the stinging agreements that had been forced onto the losers of World War I, unfortunate and aggressive leaders began to gain support in Europe, most notably Adolf Hitler and Benito Mussolini. George was said to have deplored these leaders and their ideas, but was cautious not to insult these nations for fear of being forced to enter into another devastating world conflict. Of course, we know now that this is exactly what was unfortunately going to take place, but for the British leadership at the time, there was hope of avoiding such a conflict. The heir to the throne, Prince Edward, for his part, was sympathetic to the Nazi cause and had by that time already taken up with the divorced American Wallace Simpson someone who would make an unacceptable wife or consort in the eyes of many, including George. George now fully hoped that it would be his second son, Albert, who would someday inherit the throne and prophetically predicted that his eldest son would ruin himself within 12 months of becoming king. By 1935, George's lung issues flared up once again, and by the fall of that year, he began to decline rapidly. Sandringham had remained as his favorite place to live and shoot, and it would be here that he would experience his final hours as he declined and took to his bed. 
As he lay dying, there are two versions of his last words. The first version claims that his last words were, how is the empire, before fading away, whereas the second version claims that his last words were, Bugger Bogner, in reference to a doctor who commented that he would be able to convalesce in Bogner again once he recovered. Whatever the case, King George V of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, Emperor of India, died at Sandringham on January 20th, 1936, at 70 years of age. It was thought that the doctors gave him a lethal dose of medication to hasten his death in order to prevent him from suffering and to suit the morning papers. His funeral took place at St. George's Chapel, where he was laid to rest in the Royal Vault before being moved to the North Nave Isle in 1939. George lies here at St. George's Windsor to this day. The life and reign of George V was incredible in many ways. From his youth, few expected him to inherit the throne, being the younger son of a king. His early education was certainly a failure, and this would inhibit him for the rest of his life. But once it became clear that he was developing faster than his elder brother, a ray of hope began to shine through for not only George, but also Britain. With his brother's untimely demise, George was thrust into the spotlight and played his role as an up-and-coming heir well, while he patiently waited in the ranks. When George came to the throne, he was greeted with perhaps more disaster and problematic events than any other monarch before him. He was forced to deal with constitutional crisis in his government, devastating international war, calls for independence from multiple realms under his control, rebellion, the Great Depression, and the downfall of monarchy as a whole throughout the world. Still, George, through keen intellect, wise decision-making, and cutthroat attitudes, was able to endear himself to the populace, to weather the storms of opposition, and in the end, maintain the British crown for the newly formed House of Windsor. Things could have gone terribly wrong for George, and given the events that played out during his reign, he very well could have lost his throne or even his life as a result of the unrest that existed during his time as king. But the fact that he survived through such turmoil and international drama illustrates the capabilities and prowess he possessed as a monarch. For this, George's story will remain as one of the most important stories in Britain and indeed the world.